Uh, this is Stephen Sloan. The date is May the 18th, 2012. I'm with Mr. William Womack at his home, 2303 Cimarron, Midland, Texas. And uh, this is the interview for the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission's Texas Liberators Project. Thank you, Mr. Womack. It's my pleasure. Uh, I, I want to begin in Fort Worth. Okay. So if, if, I'd like to hear a little bit about, uh, I know you're a bit of a historian, you've already told me that. I'd like to know a little bit about your family. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, my father is from uh, a little town in eastern Tennessee called Watertown is where he's born. And uh, my mother was from a little town in southern Kentucky called Glasgow. And uh, my mother was uh, married to my half-brother's dad uh, for about a year, and he was killed in a railroad accident in Fort Worth. My dad happened to be on the engine, a steam locomotive, when he was killed. So they were good friends, and he knew mother quite well. So when my brother was born about three or four months later, and uh, my mother moved back to Kentucky, and uh, my dad uh, courted her through the mail and proposed through the mail. And uh, they were married when my brother was about seven. And they moved back to Fort Worth, close to the railroad track where my dad worked. And my sister was born in 1919, and I was born in uh, October 1921. Uh, we lived there for several years, then moved to uh, the east part of Fort Worth, they call it Riverside. Uh, and every summer, my mother would uh, go back to the Kentucky to the uh, farm, which she bought with her husband's insurance money and uh, so I kind of grew up in the city and on the farm too uh, in the city during school year days and or months and then we'd go up there and spend a month or two every summer mm -hmm. so uh, I grew up there in East Fort Worth and uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and about 30 eight uh i was about 17 i imagine yeah 17 and uh i joined the there wasn't any jobs around for kids mm -hmm. so i joined the uh, texas national guard just to get their 21 dollars a month <laughs> and then uh 39 and uh well actually 1940 they started uh mobilizing the National Guard and uh, they were drafting 20-year-olds. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was going to be uh, 19 in October, so uh, I'd be prime uh, draft bait in, in, in about a year. So I'd already been in the Guard for about a year and a half, so I just went ahead and uh, joined up with them and we went to uh, Camp Bowie, Texas, down at Brownwood. Stayed there about a year uh, training, and we were supposed to get out in a year. And uh, I was actually home waiting on a discharge on December the 7th, 1941. <laughs> and of course, you know what happened then. Uh, so I just, uh, they, uh, I went back to the camp, and they said, no discharges, everybody's in for the duration. In 42, we got, the whole division got transferred to uh, South Florida, uh, North Florida, and was taking uh, amphibious training. And this unit I was in was a, the Texas National Guard 36th Infantry Division. Uh, after about a year there, we moved on maneuvers up in uh, the pine lands of North Deco uh, Carolina, South Carolina for several months, then we moved on up to Cape Cod at a, at a camp called Camp Edwards, which is uh, 
when we were taking amphibious training out in Nantucket Bay. Uh, so uh, that was in 1942. Well, in the spring, uh, I think it was April or May of, of 43, we loaded on a ship and the whole division went to North Africa. Mm. And that's where our combat, uh, we were, we were, we were in combat reserve in Africa, but we went to uh, uh, Italy in, in a few months, and that's where our, my combat experience started. All right, well, I want to go back and ask you a few questions about some things that you mentioned. Uh, when you joined the Guard in 37, what was that like? What, what, what sort of things were you doing in the oh, Guard well, at that time? Uh, the, the, the unit I joined was a, an artillery unit, and uh, uh, it was really easy. We would just meet uh, twice a month, and we'd go in there, and they'd show us how to bore sight the cannons and uh, how to disassemble the breech blocks and such as that. Just general maintenance and uh, how to transport the pieces uh, around, and you know, this is pretty essential. We didn't do any shooting or anything, mm -hmm. but it was very simple. And uh, about half of my graduating class was there. So we had a good time. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there was really no, not very military. There wasn't anybody around except people that we knew and had gone to school with. And did your family do all right during the Depression? Uh, yeah. My dad uh, was a locomotive uh, fireman at the time, and he had a real good paying, steady job, and uh, we didn't suffer any from uh, the depression and uh, I, my older brother, half-brother, graduated from uh, high school and went to work in a Texaco station down the street so everybody was making their way mm -hmm. and I had uh, an older sister and uh, I think uh, she went to, she worked a little at the library and uh, then I had a younger brother, but he just played. <laughs> he didn't do anything. So what, uh, do you remember what your pay was in the National, Texas National Guard? $21 a month. $21 a month. And that's you, what it, that's what it. You were rich. It, yeah, I was rich. <laughs> I had <laughs> money to spend. <laughs> well, let's look at that this way. I could go to the movies when I, when I was a kid, my dad would give me 50 cents about every payday. I would go to the movies for nine cents, and then I'd buy a sack of popcorn for a nickel. Then I'd go get a haircut for 35 cents, and I had money left. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that moment where you hear about the bombing of Pearl Harbor. I know that's... Uh, I know that made an impression on you. Uh, yes, it did. I was, uh, I think I was, I really don't recall exactly what I was doing, but I was at home with my mom and uh, getting ready to uh, go look for another job, a job that I could, uh, 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 since I was going to be out of the guard, I'd have more time. And uh, so uh, shortly after I heard that, well, we turned on the television. Uh, we didn't have a television. We turned on the radio, and they told all about it, and then they said all discharges are frozen at the moment. Well, I, was, I wasn't really happy about it, but I wasn't too discouraged either. I wanted to do my part, so I went in with enthusiasm and to, to learn the job and do, do whatever I needed to do. But I didn't really know what I was getting into. Yeah, and I don't think anybody did. Yeah. I'm sorry? I don't think any, any, any of you or your buddies knew what oh, you were no. getting into. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Um, well, take me from that. Uh, moment forward. I know you talked about um, weight on the discharge and you're transferred uh, to North Florida and you're doing 
uh, amphibious maneuvers there. What sort of training were you doing, and can you talk about that training and what you were doing there? Oh, uh, in uh, Florida? Uh, well, uh, we were uh, traveling, uh, actually we were uh, mostly moving the guns around. Uh, we'd go into an area and uh, set up our pieces and get ready to fire, but we didn't have any ammunition, and we weren't on the firing range, so we just set them up and wait a little while and take them down and move to a location, a new location. This was all done in, the, in, in darkness because we never moved during the day. So, and then that was the practice we followed in combat too, and I can understand why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, that was in the, in the, the swamps down there, and we'd, uh, of course, we were learning how to get trucks out of being stuck and uh, uh, where howitzers that were swallowed in the mud holes because it wasn't all on the old pavement it was cross country and the maneuvers up in uh, North Carolina and South Carolina <coughs> well we were simulating combat with uh, several more divisions and in fact it was a an army type there was a I don't know, probably three or four divisions. And uh, we were uh, doing make-believe combat with those divisions. And just about the same thing we did in, in Florida, and moving around at night and, and uh, what we call dry firing. You'd put a dummy shell in the, in the, in the cannon, pull the trigger. <laughs> of course, nothing happened, and we'd take it out and uh, move a little ways, then stick it back in and shoot again. So it was just, just practice shooting those cannons. Mm -hmm. right, can we stop? Well, I'd like to go back. We were visiting off the recording about some of your interests uh, when you were younger, if you'd like to talk about some of those. Uh, well, yes. Uh, while I was in the... Uh, National Guard, they, uh, I had an opportunity to take some uh, correspondence courses through the mail, and I chose uh, radio and telephone. And uh, they were uh, just a regular correspondence course. They'd send questions. They sent me a book, and I read the book, and they would send questions, and uh, I'd answer them. And, it was interesting. I learned a lot about telephones, how they were constructed, and how they transmitted sound, and same with radios. And uh, when I was in the, actually, I didn't tell anybody I knew all that when I was in the National Guard. That wasn't really important to me. But uh, when we got up to uh, <coughs> Massachusetts, uh, they began to, uh, I can see where I would be of use with that because we had a lot of communication problems. Wire, telephone wire is, is a, was a big problem. Picking it up and laying it down and moving it from here to there. And uh, so uh, we, and then we started getting radios. And I said, well, I know how to operate a radio. And they said, oh, you do? From what? And I said, I told them I had a course. So the captain said, We'll just use you, and I didn't know what exactly what they had in mind. But uh, when I was uh, when we were in combat, I was actually many times up on the front lines with the infantry with the radio and uh, an observer. I was not qualified to really observe artillery fire because I'd never been to an artillery school except the Fort Sam Houston, uh, Fort Sale, Oklahoma. And then they didn't let me direct fire or anything. I just, uh, up there, I, but I did learn how to play the, uh, orient the uh, battery on a magnetic uh, azimuth and such as that. And uh, so I could get the battery ready to fire if the lieutenant uh, got shot or something happened to him. And uh, so uh, that's, uh, where some of my pre-studies did affect my uh, service as a combat soldier.
You also uh, were a musician. I'm sorry? You were also a musician, right, when you were younger? Played the bugle? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was, <laughs> I was in the, I played in the high school band, but unfortunately I was so lousy. <laughs> I didn't pass the course, so I didn't. I just played one one semester, and I really didn't like it. Uh, uh, it was not no fun to to play in a, in a band, but I did know the scales on, the, and so I was a bugler for a little while, and and uh, till another guy come in and played the bugle better, so I gave it to him and let him do it. But I guess I could still play a little bit. Well, let's uh, let's go back ahead. You took me to. Uh, we went through maneuvers in uh, in the Pinelands area, uh, and then what were you doing at Camp Edwards once you transferred to Cape Cod? We were doing uh, amphibious training. Uh, we'd go out in these little landing craft out in Nantucket Bay, and uh, come back in and uh, attack one of these little islands around Martha's Vineyard. We we attacked Martha's Vineyard five or six times. <laughs> Never did conquer it. <laughs> but uh, it, it was real interesting. I liked uh, uh, Massachusetts really well, except for the winters were very cold. And I've never been subjected to such uh, intense cold as they uh, in, uh, encountered there. Mm -hmm. But uh, still, it wasn't as bad as Germany in 1944. Yeah. Because we did have heated barracks, and we didn't over in Germany. Yeah. Well, did you, uh, was the expect, I know you were following somewhat what was going on with the war during oh, yeah. that period. Uh, we were aware that we were going overseas when, uh, they started uh, what they call surveying equipment. Like if you had a, a pair of leggings, it, uh, that's where well, leggings, we had a canvas uh, leggings that we wore at that time. And if they were worn, they'd take them up and put, issue you a new one. Same way with a, uh, a belt or a pack, or if it's, uh, your rifle wasn't in the up to date, they'd take it up. and. They issued new helmets. In fact, I still got my old helmet up in the attic. When we first went in, they issued the World War I helmets, those suit bowl type things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it was a year or two later that we got in the new ones. And uh, they were no fun to wear. <laughs> but uh, when they started surveying equipment, we knew right then that we were headed for overseas, and then in, uh, in less than uh, two months, we were in, in uh, North Africa. Mm. And that wasn't bad over there. The uh, combat, we landed at uh, a little place called Mirs El Kabir, which wasn't very far from Oran. And uh, we stayed there at uh, Most Mostagium, I think, for about a month, and we moved to the west coast to uh, uh, um, Casablanca area, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, practiced our surveying. I, that's where I learned to uh, run a, a survey instrument and uh, and how to play the battery. We call it, and uh, we were in combat reserve. Because uh, the the uh, Africa Corps was just about defeated at that time, mm -hmm. and our whole division caught one German in about a four months period. <laughs> but uh, and then uh, let's see, I think we got up there in April, and then in August, the same year we went to uh, made the Salerno mm -hmm. invasion mm -hmm. in, in Italy. How was the uh, passage over for you on the Atlantic? Oh, uh, not well. The uh, sea was rough. 
We had a lot of northwesterly winds. And about four days out, our, our, uh, the ship we were on quit. The engine stopped and the convoy left us. And we were sitting out there by ourselves. Uh, and they uh, told us to uh, take our boots off and get ready to inflate our life belts. And uh, we had one destroyer that was circling us. And uh, every now and then we could hear a depth charge go off. So we were knew that uh, we were going to get torpedoed by a German submarine just any time. But about uh, eight or ten hours later, well, the mechanics finally got this engine running again. And, and we finally caught the convoy about daylight. We, of course, they were doing about 10 knots and we were doing 18 so we were full full speed yeah <laughs> what a rough ride too i imagine those are some tense moments where you're yeah, just there dead in the water there, there, a lot of times in that rough sea the, the uh, screw would come out of the water and the whole ship would vibrate so then it would start digging in the waves again and then away we'd go mm. but we finally caught up and arrived to our destination safely. Mm -hmm. Of course, there was a lot of us sick on board. Dad, did you get sick? Sir? Did you get sick? No, I she didn't. Uh, so you could have been a Navy man. Uh, I didn't like the, uh, the ships. They were too confining. <laughs> you could just walk about 50 feet from side to side and you were, then you have to turn around and walk somewhere else. So, uh, I wouldn't have made a sailor very well, I don't think. <laughs> well, I'd like for you to tell me your first impressions when you got to uh, Mill El Kabir. Just, uh, just take me through that. What were your impressions? Oh, okay. Well, we we uh, we went through the Straits of Gibraltar about two or three o'clock in the morning, and they were lit up like New York City. We could uh, you could see every ship in the convoy. From reflected from that light, and uh, so the, about daylight we got to our des designation, which was a little small port. We were the only ship there, uh, debarking, and uh, I was standing on the uh, fantail looking down, and I was amazed how clear and green the water was. You could see the prop on the tugboats churning the water as they pushed us into. To the wharf, and uh, so they, they, before we got off the ship, they uh, handed us all a, uh, a bandolier of ammunition. First time we'd ever had that much, many uh, cartridges with us. So uh, we knew right then that we were in trouble, <laughs> and were expected to use that stuff. Did you have any encounters with any of the locals there? Uh, the locals uh, stayed their distance. Uh, we didn't see a, a few of them on shipboard acting as a, a sort of roustabouts and shipboard laborers. And most of them just wore a, a breech, breech cloth and a raghead. In fact, that's what we called them, ragheads. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were I didn't see many of them, but, but uh, a few weeks later we got the, they, we got passage and we went into Algiers and, and we could see a lot of uh, Muslims and uh, uh, I guess they were Muslims, uh, native people in their dress. We were kind of awed, you know, and they looked at us, we looked at them, we couldn't converse, so we just passed by. It was an experience, uh, uh, and then uh, it's a long way from Fort Worth. Long way from Cowtown. <laughs> so, and then uh, you said you got to go to Casablanca as well, right? Did, uh, did well, get, no, we never did. Oh, you didn't. Okay. Uh, we were, we could see it. It was close enough, <laughs> but they didn't give us any leave. Uh, we were at, at uh, the nearest town of any size was. Casablanca, but there was a small town nearby called Port Laudi, but it was sort of inland. It wasn't really on the sea, and uh, 
we'd go down on our time off. We'd go to the, down to the sea, and a lot of times we'd uh, uh, we had a supply of hand grenades that uh, the Navy had salvaged out of a ship that was sunk during the invasion of North Africa, mm -hmm. and we'd take the uh, those hand grenades down and throw them full of pan and throw them in the rear in the in the ocean and the, they'd go off and a whole bunch of fish would come up and the native boys would swim out to get the fish. So we had plenty of fish to eat. And and time on your hands it sounds well, like yeah, a little bit yeah. 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 We did. There wasn't much to do. We uh my section was a, called the survey section and we mapped all the, uh, well, it was a big live uh, cork oak forest there. The uh, oak trees looked a lot like they did here, but the, ar the bark on them would be four or five inches thick, and they'd peel that off, and it was used for cork insulation. And uh, so we uh, would map those trees and plotted them on a piece of paper. <laughs> Uh, that was just to keep us busy. <laughs> now, uh, I know you're also preparing for uh, the Italian campaign while you're there. We knew that, we kind of expected that when they, uh, when they invaded Sicily to go in as uh, going on that, but we never did. And. Uh, so uh, they they were priming us for the uh, Salerno invasion, and we were part of the Fifth Army at that time, uh, and that was made up of the 45th Division from Oklahoma and the Third Division, and I've forgotten where they were from up north somewhere. And uh, of course, there was a lot of. Uh, uh, support, uh, Navy support people involved in that too. Mm -hmm. But uh, we uh, we got uh, bombed several times, but we had no casualties. The, uh, uh, we had good air cover and the, uh, they kept the German Air Force at such a high altitude they couldn't uh, do much, but uh, we did. Uh, on uh, D-Day, we did lose our first casualty was a casualty from a strafing. Uh, he was one of my best friends too. We, uh, he was a golden glover and we used to box, I used to box with him all the time. And uh, he got killed in, a, in an air raid. Mm -hmm. So from then on it was, uh, it was uh, sort of a, uh, it was no fun anymore. Fun and games ended. Yeah, you knew at that point that, yeah. that you were in war. Yeah. And uh, but we stayed in Italy about uh, almost uh, about a year, I guess. And then uh, we went to the Anzio Beachhead after that. And then uh, uh, after the Anzio Beachhead. Uh, we moved as far north as a, as a little Italian town called Sudiva uh, Vecchia, which is a small town on the west coast of Italy, on the Aegean Sea. And uh, we pulled out there and went back to uh, Naples area, to a town called Pozzoli. And uh, we boarded uh, LSTs and went to southern France. And in southern France, of, of all things I've read about this before, we landed at the town of Frejus, F-R-E-J-U-S, I think it is. And it was a town that Napoleon returned to after his exile in Corsica. And I thought that was really neat. <laughs> but uh, it, we didn't have a very big battle there. So. It wasn't a lot of resistance. No, not a lot of resistance. They, the Germans made a token resistance and hightailed it out of there. Because yeah. uh, uh, they, uh, they were the uh, army from uh, Normandy was 
it was getting starting to move at that time too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they had pressure on the other, uh -huh. on the northern front there. Yeah. Yeah, it's real funny. The day we took Rome, well, it was about the sixth of June. And I think it was the same day that they made the Normandy invasions. <laughs> and the papers didn't even say anything about, Rome, anything about Rome, but that was fun. They, it was like going to a big parade. Well, I'd, I'd like to hear more before we get to Southern France, some of your memories from uh, the operations in Italy. Okay. Uh, some of the, the scariest moments uh, is because with artillery, we couldn't uh, bypass uh, roads very easily. And the, the Germans had uh, made a practice of uh, blowing down trees uh, across the roads. I mean, dozens of big trees, uh, three or four feet in diameter. Well, when we'd try to drag those out of the way, they had, uh, had them booby-trapped. So uh, it was real, it was, it was a fun game, uh, trying to get in there and help them get those trees out where we could get through. And a lot of times they just, uh, we didn't have chainsaws at those days, and they had uh, cut the top of them out and then uh, tie a tank on to them and drag, it, drag them out of the way. And then uh, we'd try to get through there that way. But, uh, uh, that was a big problem, and then we didn't get very much counter-battery fire, except <clears throat> when we got up into the Leary River Valley, and then uh, then we were hit pretty hard in, at times uh, 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 around the Monte Cassino Abbey. Uh, I remember when they bombed that thing. I was, I was laying on my back in my foxhole, and I looked up and here come all these airplanes, bomb bay doors open. I said, oh my, <laughs> we're going to get it now. But they didn't drop a bomb till they just got past us. And then they uh, bombed the uh, Abbey pretty well. Mm -hmm. But it didn't do any good. We didn't make any more progress after that. Yeah. Just tore up everything. Yeah. And the uh, funny thing about it, my neighbor across the street was one of the guys that loaded bombs in those airplanes. He was in Italy too at the same time. But they were down at, uh, in the southern end of the country at uh, Barry. And uh, I was over there talking to him and he told me that he was loaded bombs for that bomb run. I said, USOB, he liked to kill me. <laughs> he said, too bad. <laughs> Well, as a forward observer, are you with an artillery unit? Yes, okay. I was with the uh, Battery B, 155th Field Artillery, uh, 36th Infantry Division. Uh, I was cross-trained in, in everything. I could uh, not only uh, go up and run the uh, ra radios at the forward observer post, I was a good gunner. I could lay the battery. I could. Uh, uh, sight the gun and I could ram the shells in and I could fire the piece. I, there wasn't anything about that that I couldn't do and I'd already been in the Army three or four years, you know, and mm -hmm. doing that same job back in the States. So it was nothing new uh, except we get counter battery fire a lot. And, uh, I, I didn't like going up uh, on the, on the far observe too much because after you got up there it wasn't too bad but uh, a lot of times you'd run across enemy patrols at night and that's when we moved and uh, uh, the first time I went up I was carrying a box of rations under one arm and a Tommy gun under the other and I don't know if we'd run into a bunch of Germans I'd have probably dropped both of them and run <laughs> because I couldn't fire either. I couldn't, I might have thrown the rations at them, <laughs> but uh, that would have been no good really as far as protection. But they insisted, so you have to do what they tell you to. Well, what was the impression, your impression of the artillery units that you worked with? Uh, 
Fire artillery was devastating. That's what the Germans, captured Germans said. Because we had a, a process that they developed at Fort Sill, uh, a system. <clears throat> and they called it the Fire Direction Center. And every bar, artillery piece that was in the area was tied into that. And uh, so when you uh, uh, got ready to fire, if you had a, a real, I mean, if we had a bad attack or something, we had a, a system called time on target. That's where every batter, every gun within range would fire at a certain time. And we had them coordinated so that the time of flight from the muzzle of that gun would be the same with the gun behind us or a gun in front of us so that they'd all hit at the same time. And it's called time on target. And uh, the people that coordinated that were behind the lines in what we call our direction, fire direction center. And it was very effective. Because uh, we'd have, uh, uh, make an attack, you might have 100 or 200 artillery shells landing in that same general area at one time. And we also had uh, uh, a fuse, what we call a posit fuse that we'd use it was radio controlled and it would send out a little impulse and when it got so close to the ground it would ignite the powder charge in the shell and it would explode 30 or 40 feet off the ground and that was devastating. Mm -hmm. uh, the worst thing we had was to contend with was with, with the German artillery firing on us but we had also were close enough that we'd get mortar fire. At, uh, in the Leary River Valley at uh, Monte Casino, we were only 3,500 yards from our target zone. And I would get behind the uh, artillery piece with binoculars, and I could follow the flight of that shell till it hit the side of the monastery. And that's, that's way too close. Yeah. How is your hearing as good as it is? What? <laughs> I have a, I get a disability payment from the Veterans Administration now for hearing loss. Yeah, I would imagine. That, that did a lot of damage to your ears, all the ar ar artillery uh, that you were around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, uh, it w went on for I think we were in combat, our, our division was in combat for 360 days, actual combat. But artillery unit was in much longer than that because we'd support other units. Uh, and we belonged to the, what we call the core artillery. Core artillery is an artillery battery that's not attached to any division. We were attached to the 36th division, but they'd use us to support other divisions. So we we were in combat a lot longer than just 360 days. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, all right, well, let's, you had taken me to uh, the invasion of Southern France. So you're into Southern France now, and you've established that position there. Can you take me forward from there? Uh, yes. <coughs> Our, uh, our, we were in the 8th, I'm sorry, 7th Army, which is made up of uh, the uh, 36th Division and then the 63rd and the 45th, I believe, and probably the 3rd Divisions and other supporting units. <clears throat> we went up the Rhone River Valley. The Rhone River runs north and south, uh, just west of uh, uh, Switzerland, and it's a uh, main uh, river drainage for that part of France. And the, the Germans uh, uh, were set up for defensive positions along that. They were in the defensive all the way. And we. Uh, <clears throat> We'd take one little town after the other, and then 
then uh, get ready for a counterattack. And sometimes the counterattack drove us off. And we'd have to go back and do it again. But the uh, counterattack is what we were we were really prepared for. We like we could uh, kill a bunch of people doing that, and uh, we. Uh, because you could establish their position. You what? Talk, talk about that. Why counterattack? Well, yeah. uh, the, the Germans would, uh, they liked to counterattack before you could really organize your defense. Mm -hmm. And they've had counterattacks prepared in case they lost the area that they could send those other troops in, counterattack troops, and retake that area. That was the thing. And, and we were prepared for that. So we knew that they were going to uh, have counterattacks. Mm -hmm. That was just the name of the game, yeah. and uh, that's the way everybody works. Uh, we didn't. Uh, 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 well, we, we a lot of times we'd uh, uh, fire a heavy barrage, and uh, and uh, it, we immediately move through our. Uh, our uh, impact area, and you could see the the damage we did. The houses would be all torn up, and it'd be dead soldiers all over the streets. None of them with uh, bullet holes, but there'd be one uh, buildings knocked down, and and a lot of them crashed into the debris. And uh, so uh, we were effective in really destroying uh, 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 emplacements like that. And we didn't uh, uh, have any re real uh, uh, devastating battles, and uh, our casualty rate was very low. Uh, uh, the most uh, casualties we had at one time was, I think, uh, three, three men killed and uh, seven or eight wounded. I remember uh, uh, <coughs> the worst casualty I've uh, encountered was uh, there in the uh, in Italy. Uh, we were uh, in a position, and there was a creek behind us, a little circular creek, and we were in a direct observation of that uh, Monte Cassino Abbey. Well, uh, we were in that position probably. 28 or 30 days for whenever when we got all we got was a small arms fire I mean mortar fire in our position but <coughs> one day they decided to, they'd really give us a working over and they did and uh, I was in the dugout up above in front of the battery the battery was firing over me and uh, so we started getting the fire well we shut down everybody went in their holes and uh, I was listening over radio, and uh, number one gun hollered, uh, "Help! Help! We got casualties on number one." And uh, so uh, I said, "Stand by! I'll call the medics." And uh, I called the medics on another phone. In just a minute, well, an ambulance went right by the place where we were, and down to the gun position, but the shelling continued, and then. Uh, and I got another phone call and this guy said, God damn, the both both their medics are down. And I said, oh, well, I'll be down there. And so I threw the phone down and uh, took off, jumped out of my hole and run down there. And uh, shells were still coming in. And I, I, they come in and they, there was a big bank to my left, uh, sort of a, a erosional feature. And it went down into the creek. And when I was running down per parallel to that bank, and the shells were hitting up in that bank, and I'd, every time I'd hear one coming in, I'd uh, hit the ground and double up, and, and I lost my helmet. So <laughs> I didn't pick it up. I didn't go back and pick it up. I finally got down there and the, to the where the ambulance was, and it was shot all to pieces. And the, the uh, Two medics, they said. One of them was hit in the back and he couldn't move. He was a captain. And he was laying down 
close to that bank and one of the wheels on the ambulance. And the other, the driver was laying under the ambulance. And uh, I looked around and there was three or four bodies laying in the creek, floating in the creek. So I waded out about waist deep and got one and drug him back and turned him over. And uh, he started talking, you know. And so I went back and got another one and uh, uh, turned him over and he started moving, you know, and I knew his. And then this last one I got, he didn't, he just kind of moved a little bit. And uh, in the meantime, one other guy from the other gun came over and uh, helped me. They, so there was two of us out there in that creek. And we got all those guys out. Uh, two of them were dead. And this one guy that was a friend of mine, he was from uh, Fredericksburg, Texas, a German boy. And uh, so he was hit right in here and right in here real bad and this up here was really gushing blood so i pulled his shirt off and put a bandage around and tied it real tight around his shoulder and around his neck and i was he hadn't moved i knew he, he wasn't dead because i could feel his heartbeat and so i was cutting his pants off with my pocket knife so i could get to this wound down there it was bleeding pretty bad and uh i was I, my knife was kind of dull, and I was jabbing and pulling and jabbing and pulling. And he, all of a sudden, he opened his eyes and spit out a bunch of water. He said, God damn it, Wama, watch, your, watch that fucking knife. <laughs> I said, shut up. <laughs> and I just kept working. And I got him all bandaged up. And then uh, by, by that time, the uh, shelling had stopped. And uh, another guy came over from number number two gun, and we got loaded them in. There was six of them in that ambulance, and we left the two dead ones on the laying there. And uh, uh, I got in the ambulance, and uh, the, the one of the shells had hit up on that bank, and a big fragment of shell had went right through the right window through the instrument panel, right in front of the window, uh, uh, steering wheel. Oh, I said, this thing will never start. When I turned on the switch and hit the starter, cranked right up. And uh, I drove out to the Highway 6, <laughs> turned left, and saw a little sign on the road that said, aid station point with an arrow. And I went down there and <clears throat> drove in there and the, the uh, the captain come out, and I mean, somebody come out and said, I'll take those two right there. And I said, what about the other four? He said, I don't have any more room for them. So take them down to the other ambulance, uh, the other field hospital. And I said, where's that? And he said, two, about two miles down the road. So I took them down there and, and I unloaded them. And all those guys survived. <laughs> And uh, I was sitting in there and I, uh, uh, I said, I don't, I have waxed, muddy, dirty, and no hat, I had, well, I did have my hat, I picked it up on the way by. And I said, uh, have you got a cup of coffee? And they gave me a cup of coffee and I was sitting there drinking this coffee and I looked up and then in walked my best buddy. <laughs> he had a big old bandage around his arm and I said, God, what happened to you? He said, oh, I was lighting a fire to make some coffee and it caught my shirt on fire. <laughs> that was Cliff Puckett. <laughs> so that was one of the hazardous experiences I had. Oh my goodness, yeah. Yes. But, uh, um, after the war was over, I went by and visited uh, my friend down in Fredericksburg. Mm -hmm. And he was in the car, car business and I bought a car from him. <laughs> I hope he gave you a good deal. Oh, he did, and his <laughs> wife and daughter thought I hung the moon. <laughs> well, they should. They should. But he, he's, he died several years ago. In fact, there's only one of us left, and I showed you his picture. Yeah. Well, I, I, there's another story that I know you've told I want to ask you about, and that's the two clerks at Anzio. <coughs> the what? The two clerks that came by your post that story of the two clerks that came by the post that missed the Battle of Anzio? 
Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's more of a lighthearted story than the one. Yeah, we yeah. Uh, they uh, they were catching up. They they had been bypassed. That uh, fuck it, pride more than fuck it's who it was, and uh, so uh, <clears throat> what happened was I didn't hear a little of this story until years later, <clears throat> and uh, they said that they, they were on their way up there and they went through this little village and the. Uh, the traffic was real bad and they were riding in a sort of an open pickup in the back seat in the tra a trunk bed of it and they were sitting there and the traffic is all stopped and there's a couple of good looking girls come walking by and uh, neither one of them were uh, Italian they were just old Texas boys but they had enough lingo about them to figure out that these girls were going to a party and they invited them to go with them they said well, hell yes, let's go. So they bounded down the back of that truck and followed these girls. They went around through a bunch of little old narrow streets and up some stairs and they ran right away. And, and uh, finally they got to this building and uh, one of them said, uh, reckon we ought to go in here. And about that time a bullet ricocheted off the top of that, <laughs> off, right over their heads. So they just went in <laughs> and they jerked their pistols out and one of them said, Hey Cliff, have you got any uh, bullets in your gun? <laughs> he said, "Yeah." He said, "Don't you? No, I don't have any. Give me some." <laughs> they were real prepared soldiers. So uh, one of them was a battery clerk. He never was exposed to fire at all. So they went on up to the party, and everybody was getting polluted up there. And pretty soon, well, uh, <clears throat> the bucket was. Uh, they got separated and one guy heard all this commotion and this other fella was his buddy was being patted on the back and the ladies are rushing up kissing him and so he went over and said what the hell is going on he said he said well you know carla there that was one of the girls they picked up on the way he said she said she'd go to bed with me if i'd take her to america <laughs> so I, I, he said well, what'd you say and he said well i said hell yes let's go <laughs> so this party went on and on and and nobody ever left and they were getting stoned drunk in there so they said they got together and said we better get the hell out of here and get back to the battery well they finally found their way back to the to the road where they left but there was no trucks there they were all gone so they sat down and waited for another convoy and finally they found well <coughs> oh, it was a the next evening they found us, they got back to the battery where they were supposed to be. And we were sitting there eating the supper and they come walking in and I said, hey, hi guys. And I didn't know all this had taken that place. I said, where you been? He said, oh, we've been down the way. <laughs> and so I guess it was probably 20 years later that I found that, heard that story. <laughs> but they got away with it. <laughs> Well, are there any other uh, stories from that time in Italy? I know there's a lot, but are there others that stand out to you? That, yeah, you know? uh, I have my friend <coughs> who I talk to all the time was telling me the last time we got together about, uh, we, uh, let's see, I guess that was up in the, In northern uh, northern part of Italy somewhere we took over a, a run of Germans out of a position and a gun position and we took it over it was just perfect for us so we set our gun up and there was a, a dugout uh, they had a, a sort of dugout sort of cave and then they sandbagged the front of it <clears throat> so he said that they had a new guy we had a replacement come in for somebody that got wounded and uh, so after that night, well, the, they had to put a carp over that thing and the two of them decided they'd sleep in there. Well, old Vince was my buddy and he said we were, got in there and we both went to sleep and, and uh, then I felt something on my leg and I poked this guy and I said, keep your hands to yourself. He said, what the hell are you talking about? So pretty soon he felt it again and the, 
he said he had a flashlight and he turned it on there was a big rat on his leg <laughs> he said the rat ran in there and jumped crawled in the jumped up and crawled in between the sandbags so he pulled out his 45 <laughs> and at about a range of about a foot blasted that rat and he said the sand just covered him up in there <laughs> it was terrible and he said the next day that rat smelled so bad they had to get out. <laughs> but that was a that was an interesting story. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's go back to uh, you're kind of moving village by village in southern France, and uh, because of the excellence of the artillery, you're you're not meeting a lot of strong. You, you're mm -hmm. having a lot of success and. Kind of paving the way as you move forward. Yeah. Uh, at that time, uh, we had uh, brought our battery up to strength pretty well, and and uh, I didn't have to work on the guns, and I didn't. I, I was uh, available for a, a observation, and uh, so and I, there wasn't much going on. We'd go up there and watch for the Germans. We were at a little place called Bergheim. And it was on a little hillock out in the uh, uh, Alsace Plain, and you could see the Rhine River just past it, and uh, we could see the enemy gun positions. And when they fired, we'd fire back at them. So uh, uh, I was, uh, we were having artillery duels daily, and we were using up artillery shells by the truckload. So everybody that had a a uh, driver's license for a truck got drafted into hauling ammunition and I would happen to get in that bunch and we'd <clears throat> we'd go back to the little place and uh, an ammo dump in France called a little place near a town called Nancy <clears throat> well Nancy was uh, about 25 or 30 miles away and that's a it was a with a 16 hour round trip in a GI truck because the roads were clogged with traffic and uh, it was dark and you had to drive slow. Well, I come back one morning with a load of ammunition about, oh, it was pre dawn and the, the battery was firing at the time. Of time. And uh, this, uh, Fella, uh, well, let's see. I'm, I'm getting ahead of my story. Anyway, uh, I, I went back to the. We were billeted in the houses, and I went back to the house I was billeted in, and I'd been up all night driving that truck, and I was going to sleep, and I just got my boots off and crawled in that sack, and I heard these shells coming in. They make a peculiar Sound, you can tell. And there was four explosions right out beside the, the house. And I know I, a minute later I heard somebody holler, medic, medic, number three, I think it was. And one of my friends, whom I had known for years, was on that gun. So uh, I ran out, to, got my shoes on, and ran out there, and uh, there was some bodies laying out there and there's a shell hole <clears throat> still smoking and I uh, found three guys that were uh, uh, two or three that were already dead and one of them was alive and we were the uh, medic wasn't even there and I tried to stop the bleeding as much as I could and uh, we rolled him on finally they came with a litter put him on then I saw the uh, other one he was kind of uh, blown him up against the wall and uh, he is, this particular guy was named R.B. Bryant. And he had married a girl that was in my graduating class from high school. And I knew him really well, and I knew her really well. And uh, when we were in the, uh, Massachusetts, well, his wife came up to, to see us, to see him. She didn't want to see me especially. But anyway, they invited me to dinner and uh, I went to dinner with them, and then I, they got a big kick out of me. I put on one of the ladies' aprons and washed dishes. So uh, 
<clears throat> this guy was laying up there and <clears throat> his arm was gone from right there out. And I, I put a put my belt on his shoulder, what was left of his arm, and finally got that stopped. But he had several more wounds in his back, and pretty soon the blood was everywhere. And he said, I don't want to die here. And in just a second, he was dead. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of the uh, things that uh, kind of haunted me. Uh, uh, years later, uh, I was in college, and uh, I was uh, uh, writing a geological report for one of my classes. And I, I was staying with my, and my dad's, I was living with my dad. And his, I was in the front bedroom and it was cold in there. We didn't have any central heat or anything. And so I finished my report in the bed about one o'clock. And, uh, and I slept for about a few hours and I woke up and I was just soaking wet. And I had this dream. <clears throat> I was laying on my back flat on my back and I couldn't get up for some reason. And uh, and I looked up and there was this shadow of a, of a man standing over me. And he said, here Bill, take my hand. And I reached up and he offered me this half an arm. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I woke up and, and this cold sweat. And that went on for periodically for several years until Char and I had had kids. Mm -hmm. And finally, it, uh, I wrote a story about it, and I finally quit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the worst thing I've, I've ever had, is that particular dream about that guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, I uh, wasn't subject to any uh, small arms fire or but artillery fire is bad enough. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I made it without a scratch. I guess I... <laughs> Thank goodness. Somebody's looking out for you. <clears throat> so, um, were you were all able to reach the German positions from where you were? I'm sorry? From that artillery? Were you able to reach the German positions from where we you did. were? We did. We could, yeah. but uh, they were like us. They had to move them around, and then we they had uh, we had a, a elevation advantage, but they had uh, spies in that little town. That was a uh, sort of a little German town, really. They uh, they spoke German and French in this particular town, and they knew everybody in there, and they knew everything we did. So uh, we were glad to get away from that position. Yeah. Really, we didn't have too much more trouble to, I can't think we were any, uh, uh, well, except when we started capturing those uh, concentration camps. Mm -hmm. uh, the only one I went to was uh, Plansburg, and I didn't know about that till uh, uh, they come up. And, uh, well, uh, the captain come down and said, uh, <clears throat> "I want you to take three three men from your, this gun section and get on this truck and go up to this follow this other truck." And I said, "Okay, well, what are we going to do?" And he said, "There's something up there you want me, you need to see." So that's when we saw the uh, Landsberg, and uh, it was a uh, it was kind of a pretty location, really. It was a, a big row of dense pine uh, fir trees, and a lot of them scattered around. And uh, when we got there, well, <clears throat> all the prisoners were on the inside, and uh, uh, we went inside, and then the prisoners started kind of drifting out. And, uh, and then we saw all these dead folks, and, uh, and then we decided we had to get out of there. And uh, the uh, poor inmates were just kind of, they were in a sort of a daze. They didn't act like they knew what they were doing. They were just milling around from one place to the other, in between the trucks, 
and they'd get in the trucks and out of the trucks and uh, and uh, some of them were just boys, uh, you know, like teenagers. Some of them were old men, and uh, but they all walked with sort of a stiff legged legged uh, gait, and uh, they were nothing but bones. They just had a little skin, and uh, so uh, they wanted they they they'd come up and they'd say food food. And of course, when we first started that, well, we we had rations in the truck and and uh, food scattered around there. You know, they like soldiers do; they'd get so much every day, and they wouldn't eat it all. So we started giving them stuff. And uh, uh, the next day, we found out that we made a big mistake doing that because our rations were so concentrated that it killed some of them. Uh, I don't know why uh, they. But then on a diet of uh, water and turnips for years, and uh, uh, they didn't uh, couldn't handle any high uh, protein food. And uh, <clears throat> I later wrote a story about it. Uh, we really didn't have any action there, but uh, to flower up my story, I made a little action out of it. <laughs> but uh, and then we came back, or we went back to our battery, and then we saw a lot of them. We passed uh, crowds of them on the highways, walking one way or the other. Sometimes they'd be walking back towards us. Sometimes they'd be walking forward. And uh, we didn't. Uh, enter, I didn't go in anymore. I know we captured some more, and they asked me if I wanted to go, and I said. No way. And uh, when the war ended, we were in uh, Austria. And uh, our unit captured uh, Hermann Goring, of all people. He was trying to get away to Austria, to Switzerland. And we, uh, a lot of the uh, concentration camp people were in pretty good shape. And they put us to work hauling those refugees from the concentration camps to Switzerland. And we'd go up to, uh, I think we were at Geneva, uh, and we'd go up to the border and right stop, we wouldn't go into Switzerland, we'd stop right outside the line, which was a sort of a fence, and we'd unload and walk across the border. And then we'd get in our truck and go get some more. Did you have occasion to have much interaction? We talked about you sharing food with them, but did you have any other interaction with any of the? Uh, yes, uh, especially when I when we started hauling uh, uh, refugees back. In fact, I even have a picture with a couple of refugee girls that was looked like in pretty good shape, and uh, most of them spoke. Uh, I think most of them we picked up were French, uh, French and uh, Italians, mostly French, and uh, they'd uh, tell us what they had to eat, which was nothing, and uh, about the life, of, you know, they're just treated like animals, and uh, uh, I even had <clears throat> one of them gave me a pistol, and he said, "I can't take this into." <clears throat> Switzerland. He said, here, you take it. And I said, where'd you get it? And he said, I, I stole it <laughs> from a German. <laughs> okay. And uh, I think my son has a pistol now. And uh, I, I, always, I sent home gobs of souvenirs, knives, bullets, and uh, helmets, and pistols. And I gave them all away. <laughs> To, to somebody that wanted them, so I didn't want them anymore. It just brought back bad memories for me. Yeah. The only thing I got is a couple of helmets in the attic, and I don't know where they are. If you want a helmet, I'll, you can go get it. <laughs> well, um, can you describe uh, the camp itself at Landsberg, what you remember? You said there about the grove of trees, but okay. what, what did the camp look like? The, uh, <clears throat> The fence looked like it was prefabricated. The posts were uh, 
they had a <clears throat> looked like about a four by four and then it's sticking up this way and then a <clears throat> two before out this way on another post and then a two before on the ground so that they were <clears throat> self-sustaining you didn't have to dig a hole put them in but they were supported by barbed wire they had, they had a mesh wire on this side but heavy barbed wire on the top and uh, they were just out on sort of a flat plane looked like they had cleared the, the trees off because the, the trees were in a perfect climb looked like they just put, took a bulldozer and went down that and cleared all the trees off and uh, <clears throat> there were a few trees around the front but the the gates were made out of wood and wire they were real flimsy but they had guard towers probably 14, 15 feet high. Uh, those wall defenses were about, I'd say probably eight feet, eight or nine feet, about like these walls here. And, uh, but the guard towers was about twice that high. And uh, some of them were, uh, you had the uh, insulators on them, uh, were electrified. But these at, on Landsberg that I saw weren't, they were just tacked on there with a staple, looks like, that he's used around the barnyard. And uh, the barbed wire was very definitely, it had spikes on it that long. And uh, these uh, houses, uh, barracks, I guess, some of them were sort of buried, uh, uh, one of them we saw, but most of them were just sitting out there playing. I didn't go in. I was, I wasn't about to go in any of those things, but it had windows down there right, and just ordinary small <coughs> buildings, and they were about <coughs> 10 or 12 feet apart. <coughs> and I don't know about where the, uh, I imagine uh, they had the separate latrines somewhere, bathrooms, but uh, I didn't look around that closely. I saw all those dead bodies and I wanted them to get out of there. You didn't spend a lot of time in the No, in the camp. no. Uh, why was it, do you think that they wanted you to see, wanted y'all to see the camp? They wanted us to see the atrocities that were committed. And these, most of the bodies were just bones and skin. They, they, were, they were starved to death. I, I think they don't, they, well, you get a cold and they'd kill you up there. But, uh, that was just one of the things they wanted us to see about why we were there, why we were fighting. And uh, it, it was something I haven't forgotten easily. Yeah. I'd like to forget it. <laughs> did it change at all your thoughts about why you were fighting? It did. I told them <laughs> at that time I felt like we ought to keep on shooting them. Because there was no justice, and uh, when I read about the the gas chambers, that was pretty bad too. But I didn't see any of those. Yeah. Looked like these prisoners were. <clears throat> well, there was a box car, a couple of box cars, full of bodies, on a siding, right outside of the camp. They opened these gates, and uh, they had access to the box cars in. But uh, I guess the, the inmates loaded the dead in those things, and they transported them up to Dachau, which is the, where the uh, in, uh, crematoriums were. Well, it sounds like it hadn't been liberated very long when you oh, went Oh, when in. I got there, they were just had got there. Yeah. They, uh, just had somebody had got there. Yeah. The, the uh, doors, uh, gates. Looked like they had ran in through, ran through them with a tank or something, because they were just splintered. And the intimates were just wandering out. <clears throat> they tried to talk to you, and that, uh, most of them didn't speak English that I could understand. And uh, of course, we weren't prepared to feed any of them or do anything with them, except look at them. We stayed up there about an hour, probably, uh, maybe two hours. 
and everybody got back in the truck without being told to. Well, I want to take you back a little bit. I, I left you on the wrong side of the Rhine. So <laughs> when, when, when did you, uh, when did y'all break through and, and get an opportunity to cross the Rhine? And, uh, Scott, I don't remember. Uh, Steve, I don't remember exactly <coughs> the dates, but we left, uh, there was no bridges down in that area where we were. And we went north up the river to Mannheim, and there was a bridge. <coughs> and we crossed the river at Mannheim into, into the little town of Frank, uh, Forgotten the name of that town. <coughs> the, the main town was Frankfurt. We went south, turned to due south from that point. All that, uh, the, all the uh, Seventh Army turned out. We were sort of in the middle. Uh, the west flank went through, uh, went to Munich, and uh, turned south and. And we went to uh, the little town of Ulm, U-L-M, and then uh, sort of turned south there. And uh, of course, with a big long line, because we knew that the Germans would be trying to get into Austria. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure there was a uh, army on our left somewhere. On our right was the Rhine River, so we don't. They weren't going to go back that way. But we caught thousands. I've got pictures of them. We set up uh, POW camps. Uh, one time, uh, I think the day, or day the war was over, well, uh, I was, uh, they assigned a lot of us to uh, guard a certain area. And uh, they took me and one of my old high school mates fellow name of John Rothrock. Uh, <clears throat> was from my hometown, and, and in fact, he went to school with me. And we were out on this road, just an empty highway, like his, uh, there was no houses around, just uh, trees, kind of like being, well, it was kind of land, really, like a, uh, not like going from here to Andrews, anyway, but, um, we were just standing out there on the highway and all of a sudden we heard all this noise and we looked around and here come a whole company of German soldiers in, uh, in column of about 10 abreast, 10 or 15 abreast. And there was a guy out in front of them leading them and they were stamping that ground. Boy, they were marching in precision. And well, they got up there pretty close. And we, put, we had our big old heavy duty carbines and we put them down there and said, Halt! And they all stopped. And we went over there and said, uh, I went over there and poked him on the gun, that captain in the belly with my gun, and I took his pistol. <laughs> I said, Come this way. I said, uh, Let's see, did I say? I said, Rouse! And I pointed this way. And we all started marching again. <laughs> we walked up to the POW enclosure. <laughs> with two GIs out in front and about a hundred Germans behind us. But that was most I ever was participated in capturing. <laughs> and uh, I think I gave the gun away. Uh, it, it, somebody wanted it and I said, here, take it. I already had one. <laughs> in fact, I had a lot of guns. <laughs> in fact, I had home guns and helmets and junk. You liberated these things. Yeah. We've already yeah, I liberated these it. things. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know when you crossed the Rhine, so you knew th the tide was turning when you started taking on all this. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, well, we really knew that when we got into uh, <clears throat> Alsace. Yeah. Because they were, uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, Patton of the Third Army had uh, wiped out the uh, two German armies up there at uh, Falaise Gap. <clears throat> and uh, they just uh, were almost unopposed. 
from there to the Rhine River. And uh, after we got across the Rhine, we didn't have hardly any opposition at all. And of course, the, the Russians had worked on the outskirts of Berlin at that time, too. Mm -hmm. So where were you when uh, Germany surrendered? I was at uh, Bernheim, Austria. That was a nice, quiet little town. And they, uh, uh, they, come, they gave, order came down and says, uh, hold your position, don't fire unless fired upon. And we didn't know what, what it was. And then a little later they said, the war's ended. Boy, everybody sit down and said, man, I'm so glad there wasn't any cheering or firing in the air or nothing. Everybody sat down and relaxed. Yeah. Well, how many points did you have at that point? I had 103 points, and that was enough to get me an airplane ride back to the States. Because <laughs> uh, I, I know there was a divide at that point between those who didn't have, uh -huh. because the war with Japan was still going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, a lot of them didn't have enough points, and they had to stay over there in the uh, occupation army for a while. <laughs> So when were you able to get home? Uh, well, uh, I was at, uh, we, were, we pulled back from uh, uh, Austria and into Germany at a little town called Memmingen. And I caught a truck from Memmingen to uh, Metz, France, which is just across the Rhine River. At Metz, I got on a, they had a train. Boy, that thing was rough. Square wheel train, I felt like. And anyway, <clears throat> we rode it for, I don't know, three or four days from clear across France to Marseille. And, uh, <clears throat> and then at Marseille, we stayed there and played volleyball for three or four days. And then uh, they called out my name. And, and me and 24 more guys got on a couple of trucks and went to an airfield. And there was a bunch of old, worn out B-17 bombers. And they'd taken the bomb bays out of those things and put in wooden seats along each side. And boy, I was really skeptical about that. And I was even more so when they issued me a parachute. <laughs> and the parachute they gave me must have been worn by a midget, because I, I couldn't I couldn't straighten up. So I spent the entire trip from uh, uh, Marseille to uh, Casablanca adjusting that parachute harness. When I got it there, well, it, uh, they said, well, take off your parachute. And boy, I was so glad to get out of that thing. When we stayed at Marseille, uh, or, uh, Casablanca for four or five days, and then we caught a C-54. Uh, uh, and it was plush compared to what we'd been riding in. Uh, and uh, all you could take along was your little, what we called a ditty bag, uh, with a few toothbrushes and stuff in it. And uh, uh, we flew from uh, Casablanca to the Azores, which is a little group of islands off the coast of Portugal. And uh, we gassed up, fueled up there, then flew on to uh, Bermuda, and we stopped again. That was a British island, just off the coast of Florida, mm -hmm. a ways. And then we flew from there on into Miami Airport. That was a real thrill. I mean, you see guys got down and patted the floor, the ground. I was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and we went to the into the to the airport and they had this row after rows of coke machines on each side. All you had to do is push the button and the coke popped out. <laughs> and uh, they had good uh, Red Cross girls giving you candy and cokes and whatever you wanted. And uh, then we got on a, I got on a troop train and we drunk, went north up to about uh, 
Jacksonville, Florida. And then, uh, and then the train uh, stopped there, and we got off that train and got on one that was headed west, and, and this one we were on went on up north towards uh, the Pennsylvania and those sitting states up there. This one went west, and we got off at Fort Sam Houston in, Houston, in uh, San Antonio. <clears throat> Stayed there several days and got a discharge. And uh, they gave you, uh, let's see, uh, your discharge pay, uh, some of your discharge pay, $50, I think, and then uh, $25 for a bus fare. And so I got on, the, got my discharge and and uh, the guy that was typing up the discharge said, would you like to re-enlist? And I said, would you like a fat lip? <laughs> he didn't pay any attention, he just kept typing. <laughs> so I caught a bus home and I got home about three or four o'clock in the morning. I caught a cab in town. And my mother heard the cab stop out there. She knew I was coming in. And, well, everybody got up and we had big, big time. <laughs> I'd been gone for years, but we finally made it back. And then uh, I got, that was in August of 45, and September the 1st when school started, and I went down to TCU and signed up for the GI Bill and spent the next four years in college. <clears throat> uh, then I got out and went on, I went to uh, Texas and went to graduate school down there and got out in 50. First place I come was Midland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, you, get, you were a geologist, right? Yeah. That's what your degree was in. Yeah. yeah. So what, what did you do your undergrad in at TCU? Uh, well, I was the geology. Uh, uh, geology yeah. at TCU. And I uh, just uh, went on down to work, uh, the university working on a master's degree. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, I took a lot of all the courses that I didn't have, that TCU didn't offer. I see. And then I didn't have any trouble going to work. And the fact that I worked ever since, just about. So what was your first job out here in Midland? I uh, went to work for Core Laboratories as a uh, core analysis uh, down here across the street. Uh, well, you're not familiar with the, that part of town, but it was right here in town. Okay. And I stayed here about a year, and uh, and then we went to Abilene. And guess who I met in Abilene? Somebody in the room who's been somebody very quiet. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> in the room. <laughs> and that was almost 60 years ago. And we've celebrated our 60th anniversary this fall. You should be sainted. <laughs> I'm not looking at you just so the camera knows. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah. And so I know, so how many kids? We have two. Two kids. You have a son and a daughter. A son and a daughter. And yeah. the son is, how old is Ray? About 50? Five, fifty-five. Uh, graduated from. Uh, let's see, he went to Tech, didn't he? And Maryland College and Odessa College, and and my daughter <coughs> was in uh, Tech and got an MRS degree no, before happens. she finished. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, she finally wised up, and then she she had three kids, and she moved back here about what, ten years ago, and she's been here since she worked at the hospital. Okay. <clears throat> she got her degree in nursing. <clears throat> well, now you went you weren't in Mid Midland for very long that first about a year. Okay, all right, and then you moved. Now when? But uh, when did you go? Where'd you go from there? I know y'all met. And then oh well, we stayed in Midland, uh, Abilene. Yeah. Ten years. Okay. And then we got transferred to Midland again. Okay. That was in '61, and we stayed here what four years, and got 
when we transferred to uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas, and stayed up there a couple of years, then over to Oklahoma City and stayed there four years. <clears throat> and then I left that company and got a job back here in 71, wasn't it? <clears throat> and we've been here ever since. So has your work, your work's been in around the oil business? Oh yeah. Yeah, doing yeah, core, core sample yeah. analysis. I worked for uh, uh, oil companies for a long time. The last 10 or 12 years I worked for myself. Okay. Best boss I've ever had. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you saw a lot of changes in the oil business. I certainly have, yeah. yeah. But now I'm glad I'm out of it. <laughs> Well, now I want to make sure, are there anything I should have asked you about that I didn't ask you about? Before we wrap this up here, are there some stories that you want to make sure we get in that, that we didn't touch on? Hmm. Sometimes when you start to talk about these things, that you begin to remember them. Mm -hmm. I, I remember one position we were in, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, that <laughs> was in Italy. Uh, <clears throat> we were on Highway 6, which was the main highway that goes up the Leary River Valley from uh, uh, I guess northeast. And uh, <clears throat> we were on each side of that thing and the Jerry's had us pinned down, and I crawled into a, well, I was a, in the exec section, you know, and I was helping with the fire control. And uh, they were, I had a lieutenant with me, and uh, he is a shave tail, and he's, he'd just been there for a short time. That's a shave tail. <laughs> he didn't know much what was going on. And so, before the shell started hitting right and left, <clears throat> and, uh, we were down in the bar ditch, and fortunately it was a uh, culvert under that road, and it was about a 48 inch thing. You could stoop and walk through there, but it was half full of gravel and rocks and snakes and scorpions and one thing or another. And this lieutenant <coughs> crawled in there with me, and we took the telephones in there so we could carry with the stay with the battery and we tell everybody to take cover and so they bar the shells just kept hitting and we were in there all day six or eight hours and every time we'd start out somebody they would open up again and every time they'd see any movement they'd start shooting again and we had to stay till dark when we got out and that guy went bazooki he went nuts <clears throat> and uh, he was throwing his helmet out the door and throwing rocks and cussing and and chewing out people that wasn't even meant in there. Just me and he were in there. He and I were in there. So uh, <clears throat> he just, he, they sent him to the rear and I never saw him again. But uh, what uh, crowned him off was we had a, a medic attached to us. And this medic had a, I dug him a slit trench and it wasn't quite deep enough. And he was laying in that, <clears throat> had been laying in that slit trench four or five hours and he raised his knee up, raised his leg up to kind of flex it. <clears throat> Shrapnel come along and shot his kneecap off. <clears throat> that really did the lieutenant in. He was really went ape after that. <clears throat> but uh, this old, uh, Medic, he was a, an Indian from up in the, he's Chippewa Indian is what he was. A big old round head. <laughs> he would drink a, a glass full of wine and he'd go plumb crazy. He's a nut. Anyway, he had a lot of people like that, but he bandaged up his knee himself. He had his stuff there and, and I never did see him anymore. <laughs> mm. But that was a, a kind of a wild experience mm -hmm. with that uh, goofy lieutenant. There's nothing you could do to get him in line, I guess, either. Uh-huh. Well, yeah. he just... Uh, I 
Uh, some guys went, went that way when they got under shell fire. They uh, lose it. Uh, the only thing I ever want to do is clean out my foxhole a little deeper. But uh, I never stepped my head out as long as it was halfway hidden. <clears throat> I've got a book in there I want you to take with you. Okay. It'll tell you some of those stories in there. Well, I know, I know you learned how to dig a hole when you were in Europe. I'm sorry? You learned how to dig a hole. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I could do that real fast. Well, um, anything else? No, I guess that's about it. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I never was... Uh, <clears throat> I liked what I did in the Army. I was just, I could do anything. Anyway, and the, the people, that, the, the captain that was in charge of it knew I could, and he would let me. So uh, if I didn't want to do something else, I would uh, say, well, Captain, I would think I could do better with so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so. and he said, okay, Bill, go do it. And so I was in like Flynn most of the time because I'd been there so long. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> consequently, I... They didn't get really easy jobs, but I got jobs that I knew I could do well. <clears throat> Actually, I was on an FO party when they made the uh, trip to uh, Anzio. And I knew they didn't need any FO people, so I talked to the captain. The captain said, so-and-so uh, on that uh, number one gun is kind of green, so I'd sure like to take his job. <laughs> you can put him up here on the bank somewhere or do something else but he, he said okay so I, I went down to, <clears throat> and told the gun sergeant said I'm, I'm the new gunner on this well <laughs> on this thing of course I knew him real well so he said okay you know what to do and uh, so I went to Anzio as a gunner and I got there and <clears throat> as soon as they needed the F.O. man again well I said I'm gone <laughs> So, and uh, I could drive a truck as good as any of them, and we got these two wheel, two uh, uh, little uh, uh, track driven uh, movers. I could drive one of those, but not very well. Mm -hmm. And when I'd put in the clutch, it would go whoop, and throw everybody out just about. <laughs> but uh, I got a long way in the Army, and I didn't have any problems with anybody really. What, what do you think you took from your military experience as far as into your professional career? Uh, I believe probably tolerance of individuals and uh, sympathy for the downtrodden and uh, that's just a plain old Christian attitude uh, it's like I learned in Sunday school. Uh, the guy my sister married, I met him in our Sunday school class in Fort Worth and back in the 30s. He just died, what, two years ago? Mm -hmm. Last year, year before last. Last year. Last year. And uh, that was sort of his attitude too. And, uh, I have a, I always like everybody until they, just about everybody until they, you know, some give me a reason not to like them. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> let me tell you a story. Here a while back, I was down at the barber shop and uh, I went in there and the one barber was, both barbers were sitting in their chairs and uh, and one barber was busy, and I went in there and sat down, and he cut my hair, you know, and there wasn't half a dozen words spoken in there, and one guy was mumbling and kind of cussing to himself. So when I got through, well, I paid him, paid the barber, went over and got my hat and jacket, and in the meantime, there's a fella come over and sat down in the barber chair, and I'd seen him before somewhere. So. Uh, I zipped up my jacket and I walked over and I kind of leaned over and I said, Say, partner, I said, I know you from somewhere. 
he looks at me and says, well, I don't think I ever saw you before. And I said, well, Bill Womack is my name. And he said, tell me what is what I've forgotten. And I said, mine, that's a familiar name. And you look familiar. I said, now one time there was a guy in the cell next to me that looked exactly like you. <laughs> he said, his eyes got real big. He said, oh, i never been in jail before. <laughs> I said, well, neither am I, but you still look like the guy. <laughs> and boy, the barber shop just went zoom. Everybody started laughing and talking, and they were still doing that when I left. <laughs> so if you need a good opening for a stranger, try that. All right, I'll try that. <laughs> he might hit you in the jaw, but <laughs> your size, I'm at it. <laughs> well, that's a good story to end on. <laughs> that, that reveals uh, a bit of your personality there. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Womack, we want to thank you for sitting down with us today. Uh, Robert and I both want to thank you for your service to our country and, and taking the time today to share your stories to make sure they're recorded. Well, that's fine. I enjoyed meeting both of you. Yeah.